Vision. Hey everyone, Dave here, and right now I'm geeking out over Phineas and Ferb. Dave's obsession. Dave's obsession of the moment. Ah, Phineas and Ferb, Disney's beloved hybrid of Ferris Bueller, Pinky and the Brain, Dexter's Laboratory, Michigan J. Frog, Calvin and Hobbes, Wallace and Gromit, Ralph Wolf, and Sam Sheepdog. Okay, how many disparate influences does the show need to have before you can just call it original? Created by the brilliant duo of Dan Povenmire and Jeff Swampy Marsh, who met working on The Simpsons, then worked together on Rocco's Modern Life, and then worked separately on everything else, Phineas and Ferb is, for my money, an example of that rarest of beasts, a show that actually deserves every ounce of its widespread mainstream success. Not only is the show delightful in its own right, but that success led Disney Channel to see the value in shows that were actually, you know, creator-driven, and not just committee-driven. Now, kids' cartoons have tried to reach out with humor aimed at the parents for a long time, with mixed results. Whoa. You realize most of the kids watching this show have never even seen a typewriter, right? That's a, that's a Breaking Bad reference. I realize we don't share much of the same audience. Aren't you a little young to know about all these old detective shows? Yes. Yes, we... are. But while pop culture references are one source of humor here, they're not the only source of humor. This isn't DreamWorks in the mid-2000s. There's a healthy dose of witty dialogue, absurd surrealism, good old-fashioned cartoon slapstick, and actual grounded humor driven by the heightened but relatable cast of characters. <laughs> oh, Phineas! <laughs> It's not that funny. Stand down, Fireside Girl! Throw in some of the catchiest and cleverest songs of any animated series since Animaniacs, and you've got the perfect recipe for a show marketed directly to me. Or to a six-year-old with my exact tastes, I guess. Thank you for making a kid show that parents can enjoy. Because <laughs> there's a lot you. of them that we can't, and what so it's What makes you think nice. this is a kid show? Yeah, <laughs> it's true. And yeah, some people have an aversion to the show because Disney Channel and songs and Disney pop stars lending voices and singing those songs. But that's unfair to the wide variety of other artists who have performed songs for the show, ranging from Bowling for Soup to Perry Grip to Professor Elemental to freaking Davy Jones and Peter Noon to... Oh, uh, what's his name? Oh, that's right, Slash! And he was the one who approached Disney asking if he could do a song for Phineas and Ferb. Plus, the cast also includes actors from cult favorites like 30 Rock and the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Well, this isn't much of a horror movie. Where are the rock and roll musical numbers? Not to mention the incredibly eclectic list of guest stars and a fan base that includes quite a few of your favorite people in comedy. Daddy, you ought to petty. Petty the platypus. In addition to being wildly entertaining, there are many, many facets of the show I find incredibly fascinating to discuss. Several of them have been addressed elsewhere on the internet, and believe me, this won't be the only video I make about the show. But for right now, I'd like to focus on the show's ongoing continuity. And you may be thinking, continuity? Isn't this the show that infamously sticks to a rigid formula? Isn't every episode the same? Well, you're right that there is a formula to the series. Phineas and Ferb decide to build some massive fun thing, Candace tries to bust them, meanwhile Doofenshmirtz tries to take over the Tri-State area with his latest Inator, Perry fights him, steers things in a direction that both disables Doof's Inator and removes all evidence of Phineas and Ferb's adventure. Hi kids! Why don't you come in for snacks? Why don't you come in for some snacks? Oh, there you are, Perry. Oh, there you are, Perry. And Ferb says... You know gladiators were Roman. Not Greek. It's always the same thing every day! The show spent the first several episodes establishing this formula, and then nearly every subsequent episode parodying, deconstructing, generally playing with, or occasionally outright ignoring this formula. But for a show known for its strong adherence to formula, what really fascinates me is the stuff that grows from episode to episode. It doesn't take long to realize that this is a show that can make the most out of a potentially repetitive formula. I mean, this is a show that can make even its clip show episodes unique and entertaining. Watching each episode is like watching a new improv herald that uses the same basic start and end points. In fact, Dan and Swampy have often described the writing process of the show as the closest animation can get to improv. It's, uh, it's probably the closest thing to an improv show that you could do in animation. We, we, How so? uh, we do an outline, basically what, you know, the, the basic idea of a story, and then we give it to two storyboard artists who sit in a room and try to make each other laugh. And if that's the case, they've managed to grow Danville into quite the expansive world, all through the power of yes and. Oh, mythology and long-term narrative aren't really brought to the forefront all that often, unlike your Adventure Times or your Gravity's Falls, but they lurk in the background when you know where to look for them. 
It's a cliche to compare wacky comedy cities to Springfield, so instead I'll compare it to Pawnee. A few core characters navigating a sea of delightful lunatics where even a one-line townsperson might recur and have recognizable traits. Minor background characters who have only the most tenuous connection to any of the main subplots reappear in running gags across the series, helping the world to feel simultaneously more expansive and more intimate. How do you do that? I had seen scattered episodes of the show here and there and enjoyed it, but didn't really fall in love with it until I sat down and watched the series in order, and saw how things in the series unfold. Sold! Get me up to speed. Admittedly, the show often follows what I call the Futurama approach to continuity, which is to say, pay attention to continuity only when that's funnier than ignoring it. I don't believe in spaceships. But Buford, you've been in a spaceship. Several, actually. I'm a skeptic. And while the first season largely seems to consist of relatively standalone comedy sketch episodes, they start to pepper in callbacks and running gags, referring to previous adventures in detail. Bow chicka bow wow. That's what my baby said. Mow mow mow, and my heart starts pumping. Reminding us that even though everything was seemingly reset at the end of each episode, the episode still happened, the characters still experienced it, and any changes the characters underwent are still in effect even if some of the characters are incapable of learning from some of their mistakes. But it would soon move beyond mere callbacks and into actual character arcs, all on a show where the characters famously do the same thing every day. Same thing tomorrow? Nah, I like to keep moving forward. Despite being the title characters of the series, Phineas and Ferb are rarely the protagonist of any given episode. What Phineas and Ferb are doing is not really the story, because they're not being changed by it or ch you're growing as characters, because they're just always you know, th these super positive people. They're the it's Ferris really, Bueller's yeah, it's, of the episode. What Phineas and Ferb are doing is the, is, the, <laughs> is the setting, and what Candace is doing is often the story. The formula is in place to bring these characters together, and once they are together, their relationships can grow. Take Buford, for instance. He was introduced as a fairly standard cartoon bully. And in the early days, he was the closest thing to an antagonist that Phineas and Ferb at least knowingly faced. But as he spent more and more time around the gang, he started to show other sides of his personality. I want to float around! Like men! He started to show his insecurities, his esoteric hobbies, and his affections. Ah! One day somebody's gonna ask me for some obscure musical instrument, and it ain't gonna be there! What's gonna happen then? And as is often the case, it became clear that he had a soft side. And that's how I won my goldfish. I named it Biff. After my mother. Okay, any show where the family of bullies has a member named Biff and a member named Buford absolutely knows the key to my heart. So Phineas and Ferb started using their resources to help him, and he started seeing the gang as his friends. Although reconciling his new friendships with his inclination towards bullying is an ongoing process. And it helps make Buford and Baljeet especially one of many interesting and dynamic relationships throughout the series. I was going to eat those jelly donuts! Missed you, Baljeet! Right back at you, buddy! Early on, one of the biggest running threads was Candace's crush on a boy named Jeremy. Often this crush served as another obstacle in her quest to bust her brothers, as she was often put in situations where she could either pursue busting or pursue Jeremy, but she had to choose one or the other. And as this came up more and more, her relationship with Jeremy actually started to grow. And eventually he stopped being this unattainable other, and they actually did start dating. Which brought a whole new set of Candace's insecurities and neuroses to the forefront, and led to even more ongoing developments. And there are several other relationships and character statuses that develop from episode to episode, such as Isabella's crush on Phineas, Doof's nemesis triangle with Perry and Peter, Monogram's mentoring of Carl, Irving's development from fanboy to friend, the resurgence of Linda's past as a one-hit wonder, Lawrence and Linda's consistently happy but occasionally peculiar marriage, Candace's friendship with Stacy, Stacy's newfound knowledge, Candace's relationship with her hallucinatory zebra, Roger's political trajectory, Doof's rivalry with Rodney, Norm's quest for Doof's approval, Doof trying to be a good father to Vanessa, Candace's friendship with Vanessa, Ferb's crush on Vanessa, Vanessa's relationship with Johnny, Vanessa's relationship with Monty. Actually, I think the only character with more potential love interest than Vanessa is Baljeet. The formula of Phineas and Ferb is a solid structure. It's not a restrictive cage forging each episode to conform to the same shape, but it's more like a jungle gym for these characters to play on. As the series went on, more and more episodes would devote more of their time to character growth, story progression, and world building, with the expected beats of the formula set aside, where the audience doesn't need to sit through every step, but can easily fill in the gaps. Seriously, sometimes the title characters just sit in the background for an entire episode, but we can still easily piece together what they're up to. But it all started with a well-defined structure, with just a few fleeting moments of sometimes inadvertent groundwork laid here and there, adding flavor to the familiar shape. 
And it's no surprise that half the fun of the show was finding variations within a formula and noticing the little unique things in each seemingly similar episode. Because one of the central themes of the show is finding the little ways to make each day special, discovering the extraordinary among the ordinary. Because after all, there's no such thing as just an ordinary day. Every day's a brand new day, carpe diem. Well, I for one feel like going outside and building my own roller coaster or going on my own adventure. But I'll probably just stay inside and binge watch more Phineas and Ferb. So, until next time, this is Dave, signing off.